Someday very soon, man would walk the moon. But dear spacemen take heart, this week's top 10 chart will send you up there with some groovy tunes. Newsflash people, it's my birthday, this birthday week in 1969, and these are the songs I was listening to on the radio as I sat in the back kitchen at Mount Gravatt. Come with me for signs and wonders. And kicking off the section, which is a Dostoevsky to the other channels, Harry Potter. It's hello and goodbye where we analyse that which arrived and dismiss that which departed. Two in this week. The charts say Yes Way Jose and Jose Feliciano's Adios Amor sails in from number 20 to number 8. AA will make number 1 for a week, part of a parade of five consecutive number 1s in five weeks we have coming up. Accompanying him is that smashing bird Scylla Black with her slightly terrific Surround Yourself With Sorrow, her second to last top 40 in these climbs. Departing the 10 this week are The Doors, who made number 5 with Touch Me and are now slipping down to number 11, and Manfred Mann with Fox on the Run, which slips down to 14 after picking also at number 5. Biggest hit entering the charts this week is Russell Morris's Aussie classic The Real Thing, which would spend three weeks at number 1 from the first week of May, and the biggest record to lead this week is the frankly bonkers Atlantis by Donovan, which inveigled its way up to number 3 a few weeks back. And the next number one is one of the more forgotten chart toppers, the socialist anthem entertaining fun type commune by Vane Dingler. Can you work the puzzle out? Answer on the title card at the end. Well, at this week, it's Scylla with Surround Yourself with Sorrow. It's perfectly fine, even if it does sound a bit like a 1964 Dusty Springfield record, but there are worse things in the world to sound like than the Divine Dusty, so this record will more than suffice. Scylla hit the top 40 10 times in these parts, with You're My World topping the chart for two weeks in July 1964. Number 9 is the durable British popsters Herman's Hermits with Something's Happening, another of their spoonfuls of sing-along twaddle that seemed an even further throwback than Scylla's number. This one seems positively locked into the immediate post beatle anything english is a hit mode this was the tenth of their 11 top tens down here but this one did significantly better in my old hometown than anywhere else making it to number eight while it punked out at 25 nationwide as i said there was just one more installment of herman essence to come along before long overdue obsolescence caught up with them jose feliciano rockets into the charts this week with adios amor this seems to be an era of quicker rises and fallers, with most hits, no matter how far they go, having remarkably short chart runs. Each song on the top 10 this week arrived and left within a four-month period. Indeed, that one 16-week entry was an outlier. Four of this week's top 10 were on the charts for only 11 weeks all up, three for 12 weeks, two for mere 10 weeks, and one for 16. Between the current number one and Russell Morris's The Real Things hitting the top, as I said, there were three consecutive single-week number ones, so five number ones in five weeks. Adios Amor was the third of those, hitting the top in a fortnight. At Splendiferous 7, it's Where Do You Go To by Peter Sarsnet, one of three songs on the charts this week that stopped at number two. We have four number ones on this list and three number twos. Everyone got to go this week. It's kind of a Baroque pop song story about that well-traveled trope of the poor girl who gets lucky and leaves her povo true love behind for a fancy schmancy lifestyle. Kind of like Lion Eyes by the Eagles, but yeah, not so Eaglesy. A four-week UK number one. He had one more lesser hit after this and then faded away, hopefully to a lovely retirement on fat royalty checks. Number six is Elvis Presley with a song from the rather odd movie Live a Little, Love a Little, which was the most overt attempt in his film career he had at making a sex comedy. The scene that features this in the film is some kind of weird drug trip thing with go-go dancers, the guy from Bewick, and a guy, I presume, in a spangly Great Dane costume, I think and Elvis in tailored silk pyjamas. Maybe I was on drugs and not Elvis. I don't know. Anyway, this one got as high as number two, where it parked for three non-consecutive weeks, denied supremacy by the Beatles, and build me up buttercup by the new foundations. It's the trade-up, where we look at records that in a fair world would have made the top ten, but because local record buyer is an idiot, didn't. With so many records speeding in and out of the top ten, you'd think it'd be hard time finding one that missed. But Brother Love's Travelling Salvation Show by Neil Diamond only got as far as number 12, where it hovered for three weeks before plunging to inky oblivion. I kind of like to think this channel is a, a bit of a safe space for Neil and his fans, and following his mention in our last weekish edition, this would make Neil one of the few guys to get a shout out in two consecutive videos that were set ten years apart. 
Number five is simply one of the greatest records ever made. I heard it through the grapevine by the Prince of Motown, Marvin Gaye. A superb lesson in tension and release and one of the best examples of the use of space within a recording. This song has a bizarre history. Originally scheduled in 1966 with the Isley Brothers, they pulled out of the session at the last minute, so the Miracles recorded it instead. But Motown's quality control section did not say okie dokie smokey, and it was shelved until 1968. Marvin Gaye got it next. Whitfield made Gaye sing it in a key too high for him because that trick worked for the temp Temptations on Ain't Too Proud to Beg, but once again Barry Gordy himself vetoed release. Gladys Knight and the Pips got a hold of it and made a more down-home gospel version, which Gordy still hated, but released on a tiny sub-label of Motown's Soul Records. GK and the Peas toured coast to coast, personally contacting DJs to play the record, and eventually it got to number two, becoming Motown's all-time biggest seller at that point. A while after that, Whitfield stuck Marvin's version as a filler track on his In The Groove album and late night DJs began playing it. It became a big sensation and the public clamour saw it released as a single, whereupon it sold 3 million copies, spending 7 weeks at number 1 in the US and 4 in the UK. Number 5 was as good as it got here, and it looks like Marvin also joins Neil Diamond in the 10 year apart mention club. At 4 it is the actual Beatles themselves with Oobla Dee Oobla Da, a two week number one single that was taken off the White Album. This was done in many countries around the world. Whether or not OID OID as I like to call it was the best choice for a single from the White Album you can tell me. But this made number one for two weeks in March and hung around for the positively eternal spell of 16 weeks, a month longer than any other song in the top 10. And what, my Beatly querent, you might ask would the B-side be? Well, it's the eternally dreary and overblown while my guitar gently weeps. Again, Hey Bulldog gets screwed out of a release. Three is the sultry, sexy Sandy Shaw, she of smoky eyes and stern scowl, the only woman Morrissey has ever truly loved, with the completely stupid Monsieur Dupont. Like the Herman's Hermits number, this is a total throwback five years or so, when this kind of lightweight pop seemed to be a gateway drug to the heavier stuff. Still, it made number two, again, doing much better here than the rest of the country, and it was the last time we ever heard from Sandy on these shores again. Two is a very interesting record, not a good one by any means, but an interesting one nonetheless. The publishing empire of Jerry Cassinettes and Jeffrey Katz, or Super K Productions, is worthy of a video on its own, but they were trailblazers of a late 60s phenomenon called bubblegum pop. Sweet, chewy, disposable pop songs that were all about bright tempos and brighter hook. A deliberate pitch to the burgeoning wallets of US preteens for whom rock music was becoming too heavy, sophisticated and album oriented. The 1910 Fruit Gum Company were, unlike a lot of the bubblegum acts, a real band from New Jersey who had five US Top 40 hits, the biggest of which, Simon Says, hit number four in the US and number two in Australia, and in the UK, and sold three million copies. Indian Gibber was to spend a week at number one, deposing the current top spot holder, but it was only on the charts for 10 weeks all up, which makes it so far, along with Les Crane's Desiderata, the number one hit with the shortest total number of weeks on the chart. Facts. While The Sopranos features more on-screen confirmed murders than The Wire, the ratio of murders per episode for The Wire is much higher than The Sopranos, and The Wire had a lot of off-screen murders. Musicians Brian Adams from Canada and Ryan Adams from the United States both share the same birthday, November 5th, and a collector of postcards is known as a Deltiologist. If those facts in some way made your life better, I'm happy. See how these ones tickle your fancy. It's Val's fantastic world of facts. The biggest rise of this week is Hayride by Sydney band Flying Circus, which came bounding up from 32 to 18. This will get as high as number two, being passed over for the top by Russell Morris's The Real Thing. And the biggest drop is another Aussie, Mount Isa's own Lynn Rogers, whose top 10 of Just Loving You tumbles from 11 to 20. Just Loving You is written by Dusty Springfield's brother, Tom. Highest debutante in a week of spectacular debutantes is Sorry Suzanne by The Hollies, which dropped in at 31. But also this week there are Making Their Debut, such classics as The Real Thing, a three-week number one, Proud Mary, and The Your Fated Brother Loves Travelling Salvation Show. And the longest running record on the chart this week is another former three-week number one, Build Me Up Buttercup by The Foundations, which has been on for the positively anti-diluvian 14 weeks. In the USA, Dizzy by Tommy Rowe holds sway for its last week on the top, and in the UK, Marvellous Marvin is still on the top with Grapevine. This time last year, Sky Pilot by Eric Burden and the Animals was at number one. And come this time next year, with the radio band pending, the wonderful Love Grows Where My Rosemary Goes got to number one on my birthday and spends three heroic weeks fending off the Beatles' Let It Be and stays there for a month until Norman Greenbaum sweeps it away. And the number one album in town this week is the Beatles' White Album in the midst of a 16-week run on top. 
course, 1969 is a year when there were only three number one albums, The White Album, Hair and Abbey Road. There were also only three number one albums in 1967. Something not so heavy this weekish. At the foot of the top 40 chart this week, the 4BC DJs made their best picks for up and coming hits. Let's see how their predictions fared. Greg tipped Everything I Touch Turns to Tears by Jeff Phillip from the top. You don't want to fall in love with me, pretty girl. Well, that didn't go so well. Breakfast Guy Johnny felt that When You Dance by Jay and the Americans would go far. It's pretty good, but how did it do? Mike A tipped Fool's Paradise by the Casuals for Glory. I'm living in a fool's paradise. Loving you I know could be so nice. And it was never heard of again. Lunchtime announcer Bert selected in a moment of madness by the Flower Pot Men. I lost my heart. He must have been crazy. Ronnie plumped for Sam and Dave with Born Again. Be like a new man With the whole world in my hand Nope, that one died. John jumped at Don't Forget About Me by the great Dusty Springfield. How could it fail? Don't forget about me now, baby Oh, that's how. And Smithy pulled out You've Made Me So Very Happy by Blood, Sweat and Tears. We have a winner. I chose you for the one. Now we're having so much fun. But the best tipster was Morning DJ, Mike B, who called out Sentimental Friend by Herman's Hermits, the biggest hit pick. So won't you please play a song, a sentimental song? Well, these charts sure made a monkey out of some of those DJs, but the charts will never make a monkey out of Monty. Rock on, monkey. This week's number one record is Crimson and Clover by Tommy James and the Shondells in the last of its three weeks on top. Already a US number one, curiously this did not chart in the UK. The song's distinctive sound comes because the record never got beyond a rough mix stage. The band leaked it out on a radio station in Chicago to see what they thought, but they played it on air and the fans began demanding a release. Label boss Morris Levy was pretty pissed off at this, and Morris Levy was not a man you wanted to piss off. He was the American equivalent of Don Arden, a man not averse to using extreme violence to get what he wanted. But Levy relented once he saw the sales orders, but he refused to let James finally mix it, just letting the rough version go out. Only on the charts for 12 weeks, with three of them at number one. It'll succumb to Indian given next week and shuffle off the charts pretty quick smart after that. The next and last time we heard of Tommy James was his druggy 1971 top tenor, Dragon the Line. There you have it, folks. This is more or less how the cow ate the cabbage this week. Hope you had a good time and just know that should the good Lord be a willin and the creeks don't rise, we'll be back with another instalment next week. Ish.